Hey everybody. Thanks for joining me for this pre-service planning video, pre-service video planning meeting. Um, looks like everybody's here except Matt. Matt, are you, oh, you're there? Okay, well, for some reason I can't see you. Can you figure out your video? For some reason Jeremy has a growth on his head, <laughs> uh, like Gorbachev or something. <laughs> I want to figure out my video. Uh, video. There's a button on there. You press that looks like a video camera. Garbage shot. That's hilarious. Kelsey, you're you're muted. Can you figure out your audio? Garbage shot. You got to hit the microphone button, Kelsey. Yeah, there's a there's a the button. You got to micro. Uh, it's like the thing you sing into on a Sunday morning. You know that that it looks like that. Got you gotta, it. There we go. Matt, you're you're sideways. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm hoping everybody can figure this out. I'm going to press on with our meeting here. Um, so we need pre-service videos before the sermon. Some ideas. So Jacob. Uh, I think we should do sword drills where we have to look up various passages of the Bible, right? Where it's like, um, uh, you know, who can get to Luke 15, one, the fastest and ha Luke 15, one, I beat all of you. I think, I think we should do that. Okay, so you just basically want to race everybody to scriptures in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. Not, so, yeah, no, I, I don't think so. Matt, what, what kind of idea do you have? Where do I look? Do I look at the pictures or do I look, where's, is there a camera? Like in, where? Uh, uh, yeah, just right right at the top. Oh, of the little, that's like the camera? Right background. there, that's the, where the light is. Oh, Kelsey's here. She figured out an audio. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, who 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 else? What is happening? Somebody is taking over my screen. What is going on? Is anybody seeing this? You guys see this? What is happening? He's the beezy. Listen to Jacob. He has the best idea. Listen to him. Hmm. Oh my gosh, guys! That was like a sign from God. We totally should be doing sword drills as a part of okay. our yeah. meeting. God Holy uses Lord, Zoom. That's the kind of God, sign from God. God definitely zooms. It's our incarnational. Not? It's incarnational. Him using yeah, our meme. Matt, Matt, do exactly. you have any ideas for pre-service? Um, no, but I do have a question. Okay, what's your question? Do you like seafood? <laughs> no, I don't, uh, Matt. No. Uh, oh, it's gross. all over my computer. Gross. All right, how about, uh, let's see, Jason, do you have any ideas here? I was thinking if, if you just go to, you like run around and then you can go, boo! I think it's really, Jason, it's I, I can't understand you. Can you? Oh, oh, sorry. <coughs> oh, is, that, is that better? Yeah, I don't think, it's not a frog in your throat. It's yeah. a mask. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure you need it on the moon. <laughs> I think you'll be point. Safe. Well, actually, you would need a mask on the moon. Okay. Uh -huh. Probably Jeremy, not that, that kind of mask. Jeremy, do you so. have an idea that we can hear? All right. So I've been doing some cleanup around the church earlier this week, and I had this great idea. It's called Bug Trap Bingo. Now, we have, I don't know, 10, 12 different traps all around I'm not the church playing that. inside and out. I don't know. I haven't looked inside, but I'm thinking we might have 15, 20, 25 different right. kind of. I'm muting Jeremy. Uh, Skylar, you got anything? You got any ideas? Help me out. Yeah. You old timers need to get with the times. TikTok. We all learn the TikTok dances. Um, no, I'm not uh, dancing. No. I no, I mean, look at these guys. You think they're gonna dance on? Camera? I have an idea. I have okay. an idea. I'll see, please. What if we finally used those puppets um, from the closet downstairs in the rooftops hall? It'd be cute. It'd be like Sesame Street. Uh, we, we you mean it'd puppets? be like Nightmare Fuel? No, 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 no. that's a terrible no, idea. No, no, no. It'll be no, really no, that's cool. We'll make a little well. trip for them. Those, that I've puppet closet is haunted. On no no <laughs> way. You just that. That's such a terrible idea. Okay. I can't believe you would suggest that idea, Kelsey. That's such okay. a. I'm just gonna mute everybody here. Um, yeah. So, um, I need your help, people at home. Clearly, these people are not helping very well. Their ideas are terrible. So either 
send me your ideas and your comments, uh, the videos, email me, uh, text us, let us know if you got any great ideas. Otherwise, just pray that this coronavirus ends very soon. Otherwise, this is what you're going to get. Good morning. Welcome back to Rooftop Church, your temporarily online digital church. My name is Matt, your temporarily online digital pastor. We are very grateful to have you here with us this morning, and I mean that. The book of Hebrews says that we should not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. What the author of Hebrews is saying is that doing church together, even doing online church together, can take some effort. It takes a decision, some initiative to go meet with God, go meet with the rest of his people. It's something that you shouldn't give up on. Now, in a way, it's easier to do church online because all you got to do is you got to roll out of bed and you got to turn on YouTube or turn on Facebook. Heck, you don't even got to get out of bed. I know some of you are still lying in bed right now in your PJs. I'm talking to you, Spinolis. But in a way, it's harder to do church online because there's so many other things to do. There's so many other things that you could watch. I read a statistic the other day that told me that a surprisingly high number of people who normally go to church are actually not going to church online. By some measurements, online church attendance is actually down from what live church attendance would be. Now, the reasons for that are probably many. Uh, some churches don't have the means to do you know, online worship. Uh, some people are just waiting it out so that they can show up in person when this is all over. They'll, they'll never do online church. Regardless of the reasons, though, isn't it weird that even though church is suddenly more convenient than it has ever been, fewer people are actually attending online services? Now, I don't know what exactly that means, but it's at the very least a reminder that it's easy to fall out of the habit of going to church when your schedule gets interrupted. I mean, something happens and you lose interest. We all know people who get serious about going to church, then they have a baby, then they get married, then their schedule changes, their football season starts up, and then church takes a back seat. When life gets interrupted, it's easy for God and church to fall down the priority list. Obviously, life has been drastically interrupted. This coronavirus thing has massively altered our lives. We've had to establish new routines, new priorities. For people who are stressed out or distracted, church might not be a priority right now, but it should be. I mean, we are going through one of the most challenging and bizarre things the human race could go through. We need God, we need each other more than ever these days. Why would we not connect with God and his people in whatever means possible to help us get through this? So we are glad that you're with us here today. God is glorified in you being with us here today. And we hope and we pray that you're able to worship him sincerely and that you're able to be encouraged and challenged this morning. Couple quick notes before we jump into our service. First, if you are a visitor with us here this morning, we would love to know that you are here. That way we can answer whatever questions you might have or connect with you a little bit better please go to our website at rooftop.org backslash TV and fill out one of our digital connect cards. Secondly, uh, we want to keep you updated on how long we expect to be meeting online. Still don't know. Probably over the next month or so, things are going to start opening up again, although the situation will obviously be fluid and flexible. So we don't know when we're going to be meeting live in person, but we hope so soon. Uh, We'll let you know and if there's any special circumstances that you're going to need to be aware of. In the meantime, please reach out to us if you need help or encouragement or benevolence assistance. Our pastor text line is 314-582-0093. That's 314-582-0093. And we also have lots of great online content to keep you engaged and challenged. You can find all of that at rooftop.org backslash TV. That is all for me, your temporary digital online pastor. We've got some worship for you this morning. We've got another exciting baptism to share with you. And we've got part two of our new series, COVID Christianity. Good morning. Welcome to Rooftop. We are so thankful that you have joined us this morning. My name is Kelsey. Will you guys please join us in worship? Whoa. Shame 
sure I can speak for most of us when I say that I cannot wait for this pandemic to be over. It is crazy the immense effect it has had on our society. But you know, this week I was sitting in my super small apartment with my super busy toddler, um, just letting the fear kind of overcome me of what's to come after all of this is over. Um, And I was listening to the song, Goodness of God, and the more I listened, the more I felt this comfort just kind of wash over me because all of my life in every single situation, good or painful, God has remained constant and faithful and he's never left. And I thought about David's words in Psalms 27, 13. He says, I remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He's telling us here that because of his confidence in the saving love of the Lord, he does not need to be afraid. Now, of course, there are so many things we are going to worry about in the unknown of this pandemic, but as surely as we can feel the weight of the COVID-19 virus, I pray that we can remain confident in the goodness of God and know that he is worthy of our praise in every situation. Will you sing this song with us?
trust in your goodness. God, that we can come before you and know that in every situation, you are near and you are worthy of our praise. God, we pray that you would move in all of these homes today. God, move in this church. God, we know that you are here and we know that you are good. It's in your holy and mighty name that we pray. 
Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. I'm Erin Strage, Kids Director here at Rooftop. The sermon is coming right up. Now's the time we would usually dismiss kids to their classes. The Rooftops team has put our lessons online at rooftop.org. Just click on Kids Church. You can set your kids up in another room to watch during the sermon or do it anytime this week. While you're on the Kids Church tab, just check out our other resources and lessons we have for them. We miss you guys and we hope to see you soon. Thanks. Good morning, Rooftop. My name is Jacob Prollo, and I'm the pastor of Connections and Church Planting. Glad you're joining us this morning, and glad that today we get to celebrate something special, a baptism. Baptism is something that followers of Jesus have been doing for thousands of years. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he said to his disciples, Go into all the world, making disciples of all the nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that's how we do things here at Rooftop. Now, if you've never seen a baptism before or you don't know what's going on, here at Rooftop, we believe that baptism is a visual reminder, a visual practice of what it means to follow Jesus. When someone becomes a Christian, they are washed clean from their sins and they become a new person in God's eyes. They get to take hold of the promise of resurrection that we have because Jesus rose from the dead. That's why we baptize people in water. It's a sign of washing. And it's why when we baptize people, we take them down into the water and then we bring them back out. It's a sign of their new life. So in just a moment here, I'm going to introduce someone to you who's going to be baptized today. She's going to come up and she's going to share her testimony. We'll pray for her and then she is going to get baptized. So join me in welcoming Melissa. Good morning. Today I would like to give a testimony of the power of the gospel to change a life, how God revealed himself to me and drew me to himself. Several years ago, I was invited to attend a Bible study on John. It spoke of the word existing before the beginning of the world and then becoming flesh and living among us. John describes the word as the true light that gives light to all things. Verse 5 especially spoke to me when it says, The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Although this light is obvious for all to see, many do not truly understand it. I realize that this described me as someone who was living in darkness. Through this passage, God convicted me of sin in my life and began to give me new desires. He began to take away fear and replace it with peace. As I submitted to the Holy Spirit and became willing to change my sin patterns, I found freedom and peace. And that's why I want to be baptized today, to publicly share about the freedom and peace that God has given me as I follow his Son and my Savior, Jesus. But before I get baptized, I want to ask you a question. Is there something in your life that you need to surrender to God? Because if so, let me encourage you to surrender that thing and follow him today. Thanks, Melissa. Join me in praying for Melissa. Father, thanks for your daughter, Melissa. Thanks for calling her out of darkness into light and giving her the desire to follow you and to obey your command to be baptized. We thank you for these new desires that you've given her, the desire to follow you and honor you, to love people, to die to ourselves. Lord, we thank you so much for Melissa and her desire to follow you. And we ask that you'd make today her baptism a special moment in her life, a reminder of the grace that she's been given by you and the promise uh, not only of freedom from sin, but also the promise of new life that she takes hold of. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, in whose name we are baptized and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Melissa, repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. Who died and rose again. 
who died and rose again. For the forgiveness of my sins. For the forgiveness of my sins. And the restoration of creation. And the restoration of creation. Melissa, because of your profession of faith in Jesus as the Christ and your desire to follow him in baptism, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Good job. And you too can be baptized right here in the warm, living waters of Rooftop Church. If Melissa's baptism has raised questions about baptism in your mind, if you'd like to learn more about baptism, or if you've been thinking about baptism for a while and you're ready to take that step, we would love to talk with you for any of those situations. We think baptism is important and we'd love to walk with you through that process. You can do so uh, through rooftop.org slash TV. It's our response site on our website. And there's a, on the connections card there, there's a baptism mark that you can check to let us know and we'll follow up with you. Well, I want to welcome you to Rooftop Church and our Sunday morning online service. We are so glad that you have tuned in with us today as this has become the new Sunday normal. My name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor of spiritual formation and small groups here at Rooftop. And we'll get to our message here in a moment, but we want to take care of some housekeeping items first. If you are new to our online community and this is your first online service that you're watching, welcome. We are so glad that you have joined us. We would strongly encourage you reaching out to us and letting us know that you are here at our website, rooftop.org slash TV. There is a connections card there. There's a place just to fill out your name and some basic contact info. Say, hey guys, I tuned in. Uh, thanks for letting me join your online community. We'd love to reach out to you and just say hello and, and get to know you a little bit better. So if you're willing to do that, that would be a real blessing to us. Also, we are living in crazy times, nothing that you aren't aware of. However, just because we're not able to come to the big uh, building here and do our normal church thing, that doesn't mean that church isn't happening. We've got a ton of stuff happening on the website, on our Facebook page throughout the week. We encourage you to stop in and check out also, we have small groups via Zoom that are available that you can join in. Even if you're new to Rooftop, you want to check out a Zoom group and hear some of the midweek teaching and, and discussion, you can do so. Rooftop.org slash groups will get you connected to a group there. And if you have youth, if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler and they're tired of sitting at home and they'd like to engage with some other students and you'd like to get them in our, our uh ministry here for youth. You can go to rooftop.org slash youth. We have a Sunday big group Zoom meeting at 4 p.m., which we'd love to have you join. And we also have some breakouts throughout the week. And as the shutdown subsides and activities come up, uh, we'll keep you posted as to the next opportunities to get out and to re-engage with our youth here at Rooftop. So those are a bunch of the things that are happening here. All right, I have an opening video for you, and then we'll get into the message. A Bankstown mother and daughter have been charged after a fight over toilet paper in Woolworths. The vision of the shoppers arguing with another woman went viral as supermarkets impose new purchase limits to curb coronavirus hysteria. The fight over toilet paper that went viral around the world. I just want one pack. No, not one pack. Now the 60-year-old mother and her 23-year-old daughter, who were wheeling a trolley full of rolls at Woolworths Chalora, have been charged with a fray and are due in court next month. I cannot understand the logic. Uh, we have a big factory in Penrith that produces toilet paper. Investigators spoke to the other woman, a 49-year-old, who'd allegedly been assaulted, but she wasn't injured. The incident, one of several at Australian supermarkets, as desperation for toilet paper reaches irrational levels. Everybody, please stay calm and be rational. We have everything we need. For the second time in a week, Woolworths and Coles have been forced to crack down on the number of toilet paper packs allowed to be purchased. At Woolies, customers are now limited to just two. But here at Coles, it's down to just one per person. We have asked our suppliers to focus on increasing production of larger pack sizes. A pack of 30 rolls should last an average family for around three weeks. We can all get enough toilet paper if we all calm down a little bit. Hannah Sinclair, Nine News. Well, I've just decided that I'm going to use Australian clips for every sermon. You gotta love the accent, right? Well, as you can see, 
Panic is a powerful thing. Right there in the grocery store, over toilet paper, when panic sets in, rational thinking can quickly depart. And when rational thinking goes away, irrational behavior often follows, even to the point of criminal charges, which is what we saw happen in that case over what again? Toilet paper. Well, the last two months have brought about events and circumstances that could very well lead people to panic in any number of ways. We've had a global pandemic, though maybe not as severe as initially reported. There is a disease that literally has crossed the globe. There's been an historic stock market crash with people's life savings and retirement funds plummeting to previously unknown uh, percentage levels. Last month, we had the nation of Italy panicking on a hold to the world saying, we need help. We can't handle the health crisis that has happened because of the disease. It has since gotten better, but it was horrific, the news reports and the images coming out of Italy. And then most recently, politicians have panicked. They've seen everything happen. They don't want to be seen as not acting or reacting to the needs of the people. So in a very short period of time, they passed the most massive spending bill ever with trillions of dollars and more is keeps on coming. Now, I know some people needed it, but billions and billions of dollars is going to be lost or it's going to be wasted or it's going to be fraudulently acquired by people who don't need it. And all these things are what happens when you try to pass laws and do anything in a panic. And then you have the rumors and fears of the shortage of goods, which has led to long lines outside of stores and empty shelves. Not an unfamiliar sight in many stores that we go into these days. In fact, just this week I was shopping for some groceries and I saw my first bag package of toilet paper still on the shelf mid-morning. It was amazing. It had been two months since I'd even seen a whiff of toilet paper. So maybe the supply is finally catching up to the demand. All this to say, the world has changed in the last two months. And this, though this might sound like an overstatement, I don't believe it is, it may never be again like it was before. And this is why we are teaching a series called COVID Christianity. Life has changed. People are dealing with all sorts of new realities right now. Granted, some people are very, living very similar lives to how they did before, but many people are living differently. They're struggling with loneliness, with anxiety, with financial ruin, with health issues, and with the grief of losing loved ones on top of everything else or not being able to see loved ones who are elderly and in care facilities. Well, today's message hopefully will address that at least in part, and it's entitled Finding Peace in a World of Panic. Now, while the kind of events that we are experiencing are unprecedented, facing struggles as people and as a larger society, a group of people, is not new. Human existence has been about suffering and struggle since the beginning of the world. Sure, this is new for us in the 21st century because of our technology and the relatively easy life we live by comparison. But the Bible talks time and again about societal collapse, pestilence, invasions, all sorts of suffering back in Bible days. And even in the centuries since, we know that history tells us that mass suffering and extensive hardship has continued time and again, century after century. In all of this, there is one clear and concise message God wants all of us, his children, his people to hear and remember. And that's this, he is in control. No matter how dark, no matter how discouraging, no matter how bleak the world might look, God is in control. Isaiah 45 says this, the prophet Speaking God through the prophet, I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. And the prophet Jeremiah states in Lamentations, Who has spoken and it came to pass? Unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? We need to remember that the creator God of the universe, in spite of how things might appear, is in control. And we could take refuge. For today's message, we can find peace in that truth. Now, I understand in many cases this is easier said than done, right? Peace is not easily obtained for some of us. And that's what we preachers sometimes do, right? We get up here, we gloss over the real problems that real people are facing. We stand up here with our spiritual platitudes without any real solutions for you. Well, today, I hope to give you something that is practical, 
that is applicable. I want to give you a tool for your spiritual life in regards to how do we deal with panic, anxiety, and worry. And with the rest of our time, I want to give us what I believe God wants his people to know and do in the midst of a panic. So this morning I have what I'm calling a spiritual formula, straight from the Bible with centuries of proven results. So what do we do when we see the panic going on all around us? Or feel the panic that can well up within us? What is God's plan for finding peace in a world of panic? Well, let's look at our scripture this morning. We're in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now this verse, if you don't know, is a roadmap for how we should deal with fear and anxiety and the panic that results from that. The first piece of the formula is found at the beginning of the passage in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. It's clear. It's forthright. Don't be anxious about anything. How do we do that? How do we not be anxious? Just like this verse is telling us what to do. Well, this leads us to our first step. And our first step is this. We need to push back and get perspective. We need to push back and get perspective. God gives us a job, you and me, in this formula. We have responsibility. We have to, with our will, engage our worry and our anxiety. We need to reject it in our minds. Now, I know when we feel anxious, when we feel worried, we don't even know we're doing it. And sometimes it feels like there's absolutely no control over it. However, the Bible tells us otherwise, that we are not helpless, but rather we have an ability to engage our worry and our anxiety. Even though we might lose nine out of ten times, and it might feel hopeless, we are still called to resist. We're still called to fight against the anxious thoughts that seem to overpower us. In Matthew chapter 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about his provision and just worry and anxiety of the day. And we are told three times by Jesus in a 10-verse passage what to do with anxiety. In Matthew 6, verse 25, we are told, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. And he goes on to talk about our life and aspects of our life. In Matthew 6, 31, again he says, Therefore, do not be anxious talking about what are we going to eat and drink. And later on in Matthew 6, 34, he says again, do not be anxious when talking about the future. What's tomorrow going to bring? In all three, we are commanded, don't be anxious. Now, Jesus would not tell us to do something, I don't believe, that was impossible for us to do or for God to do in us. So how do we do this? Well, we have to battle in the realm of our thoughts and in our minds. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 that's been really important to me in my spiritual walk these many years. And it's this. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You may not think it, but you and I are able to take our thoughts captive. We're able to capture the thought before we think it and then before we feel and act upon it. Now I know it can sound tiring. Boy, Jeremy, the Christian life sure seems exhausting if I have to keep track of every thought. Well, you know, sometimes it is because sin doesn't sleep. Sometimes we have to fight against worry and anxiety. We are not helpless victims in this life. We are participants in the struggle. I want you to think about a worry or a thought that might come in and just inundate you over and over again. We need to push back on that say, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. It's just like as if we were to walk into the gym for the first time, having not been there in a long time or forever, going to one of the machines for which we're not really equipped to use, not putting any weight on it, laying down and just pushing up the bar over and over again. We'd feel childish. We'd feel like a kid. And yet, that is where you have to start. And if you do that over time, you get the motion, you get confidence, you can start putting on the weight, and you can start seeing results. That is what this process is like. 
We're worried about our health and safety. We're worried about finances. We're worried about children. We're worried about our job. We're worried about the government. We're worried about any number of things. What can we do? We need to take that thought and we need to confront it with what is true. And Scripture speaks at length about all of our worries and our anxieties and what is true. We cannot just sit back and take these worries and these anxieties and hope that they'll just go away. We can't just ignore them. We must confront them. As I said, even if 9 out of 10 times or 19 out of 20 times they just come back and we can't win, we need to fight nonetheless. As we push back, we also need to get perspective. We need to see the big picture. Now, I know this is annoying to hear. We've all heard it when things are going bad. Someone might say, well, you know, it could be worse. I hate that. But you know what? It's true. Even though it's cliche, it's true. Jesus in that same passage, when he says, do not be anxious, he tells us to consider things other than our own suffering, our own shortcomings, our own worries. He first says, consider the birds. The birds, yes, the birds, the birds that fly around all over. They're provided for. God provides for them. They're wonderful. They sing songs every morning. Consider the birds. You're in trouble? Consider the birds. He wants us to get our minds off of ourselves and to think about other things. And also, he wants us to think about he provides for the birds. How much more will he provide for us, his children? He also says, look at the flowers. What? The flowers? Yes. You're struggling. You're in trouble. You're worried. Look at the flowers. Have I not clothed them in beauty, even though they are fragile and pass away with the wind? Will I not provide for you and care for you all the more as you are more valuable than the flowers? He wants us to take a bigger perspective, to get a bigger picture of what's happening. The great danger of anxiety and panic is that we become consumed with ourselves. Our view becomes very narrow. We become very self-focused. We can become self-obsessed. We need to push back against the anxious thoughts. We need to also think about reality and that there's a bigger world, a bigger perspective out there. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 9 talks about worry. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. Right? And later on in verse 9, he says, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Peter is telling us when you struggle, when you're anxious, when you're suffering, seek the Lord, but also think more broadly. Don't get consumed in your own little world. Remember, there are others who are loving Jesus and following him who are suffering just like you. That helps us. That's one of the steps to get us out of our panic. So we need to remind ourselves that we are not alone in the struggle. We need to push back. We need to get perspective. Our second point then is found in the second part of verse 6, and it's this. We need to pray, pray, pray. If you look at the second part of verse 6, it says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. When do we pray? In everything. We pray in everything, the big stuff, the small stuff, the important stuff, the not important stuff. If it has an ability, whether small or large over time, to weigh us down and to pull us away from God's design for us, we need to pray about it. How do we do that? Well, go for a walk. We need to get outside in this time. It's the perfect time of year to be here in St. Louis. It's my favorite time. Go for a walk. Pray out loud. If you're afraid people will think you're talking to yourself and going crazy, put in some earbuds. They'll just think you're, you're singing. Get a journal. Write down your anxieties. Write down your worries. Write your prayer next to them so you can record and see what kind of progress you are making with regard to your prayer. See, maybe what's changing over the weeks and the months. We need to be creative in our prayer. Another thing is to memorize verses. Memorize verses that deal with the issue that you're struggling with. And when that worry comes in, when that anxiety comes in, say the verse and then say it again and then say it again. You may need to say a verse hundreds of times if necessary, but nonetheless say it because eventually the truth of God will win out. We are told in everything to pray, whether it be great or whether it be small. It all matters to God. As I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about times in my life when I 
was panicking. And one of those times was when I was 18 years old. I've shared about my time in the Marines before, and the Lord led me in through a series of events. I'm very confident of that. But right before I was supposed to go in, I was having my final interview. Now, I'd been asked a bunch of questions before, and I'd answered them honestly. But at this final interview, it was different. I was taken downtown to Detroit, the big office building. I was in this dark room. There was a a gunnery sergeant I did not know who was asking questions multiple times. It was like an interrogation. And he asked the question about medical or drug substances that I had taken in my life. No, I had never taken any drugs. I hadn't even smoked a cigarette. And I, so I had told them no, confidently. However, in that moment, I remembered that when I was in third and fourth grade, I had taken Ritalin. I only took it for a couple of years. I stopped taking it uh, after uh, just those couple of years and never took it again, never thought about it after that. And so when I had been asked previously, about it, I had told the truth, but this time, for whatever reason, it came into my mind. And I remember thinking in that moment, should I lie? No, I've not said it before, but if God's leading me into this, then I shouldn't lie. Well, I told him, said, well, I hadn't mentioned this before, and I just remembered it now, but I took Ritalin for a couple years in third and fourth grade. I was like, oh, okay. Took, took that down, didn't say anything of it, moved on to the rest of the questions. I left thinking everything was great. I go back. I get back to the recruiting station and the gunny there, gunny kite, as soon as I walk in the door, starts cussing me out. They had called and told him I was out. Taking Ritalin at that time was a disqualifier and I was done. And he just cussed me out. Zilky, you're a stupid blankety blank blank. Why didn't you just keep your mouth shut? Why didn't you? And I didn't know. I couldn't believe it. Here I had told the truth and the path that God was leading me on, as I told the truth, was taken from me. Because I had nothing to hide, they had never told me to lie like they told all the other guys who did have things to hide and did lie. And so when confronted with the question, I didn't know, and I don't know that I would have and should have known. So I get home, and I'm distraught. I'm just, I can't believe, God, you've led me this far and pulled the rug out. And I just remember being overwhelmed with worry. And I had been reading... Uh, the New Testament a lot at that time since my recommitment about seven, eight months earlier. And I was going through the New Testament real quickly and I stopped in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And there's a verse there that says, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in our suffering so that we can be a comfort to others. And as I read that verse, I realized, God, this has your name written all over it. And I said that verse again and again and again. As I suffered and felt like I was suffering, I realized I'm not suffering without purpose. And I prayed that verse over and over. And after a short period of time, I talked to my mom. I got the doctor's name. They had lived in in Windsor, Canada. But little did I know, at that point in time, they were vacationing in Maui and Hawaii. But you know what? With God's help, in 10 minutes, I'm talking to Dr. Edmund walking off the golf course in Maui. He said, Jeremy, I remember your mom. I remember your case. I'll do what I can. I'll write you a waiver. And he wrote me the waiver, and I was able to enlist. My point, when we're worried, when we're overcome with anxiety and panic about something that's happening, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord, however you have to do it. Seek after him. Because that leads us to our third point and the result. If we push back and get perspective, and if we pray, 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 we will be protected by peace. Philippians 4, 7 The second verse in our two-verse scripture this morning says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. We are promised the peace of God, which is a powerful thing. We are promised the peace of God, which is a supernatural thing. It says here, surpasses all understanding. It can't be explained. Did you know that it's not abnormal for a follower of Jesus Christ to have peace in their life? in a situation where a non-Christian is overwhelmed? It's because we have this gift, this Holy Spirit, who gives us a supernatural peace to not be distraught in the worst of circumstances. It's part of the Christian life. It's part of how God has called us to live. There's some great peace verses that can help with this. I want to touch on these for you this morning. Psalm 46.10, if you don't know this, it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Great psalm about peace. Jesus gives two wonderful verses in the book of John. He says, John 14.27, Peace I leave with you. 
My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And my favorite, John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Will have. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart. Be encouraged. Jesus wins. We look at the world and it's chaotic. And it's out of our control. The media loves to inflame any and every situation to its worst possible outcome. You know what? We need to stop watching. If you're a media junkie, if you're reading and watching Facebook, Twitter, online websites, television, whatever, unplug, pull back, shut it off. It will only add to your panic and your anxiety because we need to remember that Jesus Christ has overcome all of it and he wants you and me to have peace. There's a second aspect of this peace. It's not just supernatural, it protects. It will guard the hearts and minds of those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Now, not only does God care for us, as we talked about in verse 2, but he cares specifically about our hearts and our minds. I love that. We live every day based on our thoughts, based on our feelings. That's how we act. And yet God, in this verse, puts, he gives us his peace, which is a guard. But it's not some passive peace that kind of settles and moves about and comes and goes. No, it's like a fortress. The peace of God is like a fortress. It's like Fort Knox. Those of you that don't know, Fort Knox is an army base in Kentucky that was built during the Civil War. It was built, the, the building here where the uh, gold supply is kept was built in the 30s as a safe and secure place to protect it as the gold supply increased during the Depression. This building is considered one of the top five most secure places in the world, if not number one. Now, I learned about Fort Knox first as a kid through Bugs Bunny when Yosemite Sam tried to get away with some Fort Knox gold bars. He failed, by the way. And then I learned about it more later in the James Bond films when he, they would film some scenes in a replica of Fort Knox. We don't know a lot about Fort Knox and all that goes into its security. You can see it here in the picture as you drive by North Dixie Boulevard. It's right out there in the open. They're not hiding it behind some walls. It's there, but there are no visitors allowed. Not even presidents can visit Fort Knox. And it's out in this open area. Now, you don't know this, but people believe they're filled with landmines and motion sensors and other security measures buried underground. Also, you can see here, what you can't see, there are four levels of fences that surround the compound. There are machine guns. There are guard towers, guard boxes, fortified concrete and steel walls, motion and seismic sensors. There's a huge vault inside, and that's only what we know. And why so much security? Because it houses an estimated $2 trillion. Once in the history of the Fort Knox have cameras been let in. It was back in 1974, and this is a picture from that visit. They believe today that $2 trillion of gold and the country's wealth is stored there. Now that's a treasure. And Fort Knox, as far as we know, it's impenetrable. You want to know what else is impenetrable? The peace of God. As the peace of God guards our hearts and our minds in Christ, it is impenetrable. There is nothing the world can do to break through. There is nothing the enemy of God can do to break through. When God puts up a fortress, he puts up Fort Knox. Nothing can get in. Nothing can tear it down. And like Fort Knox, the peace of God is guarding something so valuable to God, and that's you and that's me. We are precious to God. In fact, we're more precious than $2 trillion. And how do we know that? Because God can make $2 trillion dollars what God had to do for us is sacrifice his own son, Jesus Christ. That's how we can know that we're much more valuable than whatever trillion amount of dollars there might be in Fort Knox. Our minds and all of our thoughts, our hearts and our feelings, these things are so valuable to God. We, you and me, are so valuable to God. So how do we find peace in a world of panic? What's the formula? Well, we have to push back and get perspective. We need to pray, pray about everything, but we need to pray, pray, pray. 
And as we do that, we need to remember that in that, we can obtain the peace of God, which is supernatural. And it's Fort Knox strong. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to not just have Jesus, but to have this amazing gift of peace given through your spirit and through your word as we engage with the struggle of our day. You know, as you said in the verses in John, that we will face trouble. It's going to come. But what we have to do is we have to engage. We have to push back. We have to fight. We have to resist. And as we resist and entrust ourselves to you, we can take confidence that you have overcome the world and you will give us the peace that will protect us. In the midst of the uncertain days in which we live, I pray. I pray for the community that is watching, that is part of Rooftop, or that just happens to stumble upon this video and watch the community of faith. May we know and may we trust you that you are walking with us in every aspect of each and every day. And may our trust in you and love for you grow during these days, not lessen. As a result, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now is the time in our service when we want to give you the chance to respond however you feel compelled. If God's stirring something in your heart, you should do something about it. You can respond even when you're at, right there at home. There's a few ways that we want to let you know how you can do that. The first is you can text. You can text us at 314-582-0093. And you can send us a question or a prayer request, or some other thing. And the pastor's here. We'd love to follow up with you. We'd love to engage you and find out how you're doing and continue in that conversation, whatever it is that God might be encouraging in you now. We have connect cards that you can fill out digitally at rooftop.org slash TV. You can request information, and we'll get it to you if you're a visitor. We'd love to hear from you through that, through that venue. And also, we have drive-through prayer. Every Sunday from 9 to 4, we have drive through prayer. And because we can't meet as a large church here, we want to make available the opportunity for you to come and visit. Maybe you just want to talk, you want to be prayed for, you want to pray for somebody else. We would love to do that. Several of us stick around just to engage and spend time spiritually with those of you that want to come. Come on by today. We would love to do so. We'll be here until 4. We're also going to take our virtual offering at this time as well. Now, if you're just visiting us online here at Rooftop, we'd, we'd like our visitors just to feel no pressure obligation to give. We're just glad you're here. We're glad you've tuned in. But if you're part of the Rooftop Church, you're part of the family of God, he's still calling us to give and to be generous with what he has given to us. We want to encourage you to give obediently and give joyfully to what God is doing. And thanks to the Rooftop Church family that has continued to give. We've been blessed during these times. Uh, we want to thank you for those you have give. Please continue to do so as we ride out whatever crazy time it is that we're living in. There's a few ways you can do that, that you can give. The first is online. You can give online at rooftop.org slash give. Go there and you'll find some instructions on how to give. Second, you can set up a recurring gift. Uh, you can do so via our website or you can also do it through your bank. That's the way a lot of us give. We give monthly and we have a, a, a check or an amount deposited each month. You can give via text. You can text any amount to 84321. And then also, of course, you can mail in any checks or gifts that you would have to 9217 Gravoy Road, St. Louis, Missouri, zip code 63123. We've got another song here at the end of our service. We want to invite you back to Rooftop TV next week as we continue through our COVID Christianity series. Matt will be back up and he'll be teaching on the topic preparedness in a world of ruin. Thanks for joining us.
much for joining us this morning. We are so glad to have you. Please don't forget to connect with us online at rooftop.org slash TV. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.
Sing a little 